this is probably the first presentation I made of this nature because the majority of my work surrounds the zeitgeist movement or things that are related to my film series. But I tailored this very uh, carefully uh, to what I felt the audience of this, of this uh, event would find interesting. The working title, as noted in the program, is When Normality Becomes Distortion, Reflections on a World Gone Mad. But as the talk developed, I experimented with a few other less sensationalized titles uh, to see what would work better. The second one I came up with was When Intuition Fails, The Inevitable Breakdown of Human Assumption and Its Social Consequences. Not bad, a bit too wordy though. Uh, so when I finished the presentation, it struck me to have a little more intellectual one. Limited Dimensional Thought in a Multidimensional Reality. All right, so a little annoyingly intellectual, but still okay. Uh, regardless, I point this out uh, so you can kind of make your own decision uh, which title you think is more applicable because they actually cognitively highlight different context I'm going to present here. As far as myself, as introduced, uh, it's usually at this point I might say something about who I am, my credentials and experience, as though frankly many of us should care. <laughs> One of the great failures of critical thought is the assumption of authority around a given data set. People might think, well, this person is considered an expert in a given field due to the standards set forth by culture, so therefore I can just trust blindly anything they say without critical evaluation. A rather ominous perspective, and I think most would agree a large number of atrocities historically can be found sourced to this blind dedication to the statements of supposed authority. So who am I? Well, I'm just like you. I'm a compiler and a messenger. You should have no faith in anything I say here and rather be prepared to critically assess whatever issues noted on your own accord within, of course, the bounds of your logical reasoning and training. As I will expand upon later in this talk, there is actually no such thing as the origin of any information. I view knowledge as a life form in and of itself. There is no empirical source and it evolves and multiplies just like any other organism utilizing the vehicle of our collective human experience, transference. And like biological evolution, it is self-correcting. Any false thought will eventually, even after long struggles, be seen by the environment and selected out by the collective awareness, or what could also be called the group mind, which I will talk about again a little bit later. Furthermore, the premise of this talk regards not the specifics of any discipline of knowledge or understanding, but the mechanics of it, specifically the nature of its change. I'm less interested in what people think and more interested in how they came to think it and how they maintain it as valid. This talk will not only consider such frames of reference as they're often called, frames of reference individual people utilize to generate and support their decisions and beliefs, but also the larger order institutions that arise from those referential assumptions once they are shared by a large enough group of people to hence define social normality, which of course is the status quo that we all know. Then these status quo practices will be qualified or even quantified against what we could haphazardly call our objective reality, which will draw its assumptions from a completely different referential benchmark than most of the population of the world is familiar with, a frame of reference we have come to know as the scientific method. Now, you'll notice I said haphazardly term an objective reality. Why? Because the concept of objective can only be hyperbole, right? How could we possibly be so arrogant to assume at any point in time in human history that we have ever been empirically right? It simply hasn't happened yet if you take the broad view. It wasn't until the past couple hundred years that the scientific method has barely been taken seriously with respect to human affairs and society. And what is the core mechanism of the scientific method really? Self-correction. Self-correction through testing and logical calculation and hypotheses. The self-correction attribute of science is what enables its evolution. There is no recognized phenomenon that isn't undergoing a constant change of definition as the evolution of knowledge continues. Truth itself is an emergent distinction. It's a, not a noun, it's more of a verb, which constitutes an approach towards reality, but never ever getting there. 
that said, it's obvious that we're doing something right, you know. Uh, the fact that this building we're in uh, it hasn't collapsed upon us means we have been able to come in harmony with some kind of natural physical law that exists beyond, beyond our control. The fact that we understand to a certain degree how our bodies work, creating, say, medicines that can help us in positive ways over statistical time, shows that we are indeed in some kind of alignment with what we call nature, as opposed to blaming our sickness on gods and demons as we did in the past as this organism of knowledge continues to evolve. There does seem to be a pre-existing logic, and this is important to note because people take this for granted, a logic in fact which dictates our reality and doesn't give a damn what we think of it and impose upon it. It appears we can either be vulnerable and align as best we can and engage this harmony, or we can walk against it, fight it to our personal and social disadvantage. The unfortunate thing is, as I will continue to address later in detail, our basic social construct as a whole, top to bottom, along with the dominant human values inherent to it that support it, appear to be firmly walking against the natural order that exists that we are slowly discovering, becoming more and more decoupled from reality as it were, and hence really our life support. For the sake of argument, I would like to quickly reduce human perception to two basic modes of operation, emergent and traditional. Today the traditional element is clearly the most dominant. Uh, it's the, the cultural zeitgeist, if you will, no pun intended, is always based on institutions that are tending to perpetuate themselves, non-emergent thought processes and their consequences. Why? Because, well, they're forms of psychological security, aren't they? They're also forms of financial security. Our whole society is actually based upon institutional self-perpetuation, whether it is the preservation of a political administration, a corporation's market share and hence dominance, or say even a religious demographic. In fact, the traditional notion is so powerful that the very act of questioning is often met with disdain in the culture today. Some, in their defense, have even gone so far to suggest that all beliefs and values must be equal and respected, and they must be tolerated in the same element of quality. Is that true? Are all values equal? Does everyone have the right to believe and hence act upon whatever they choose? Are we all to respect everything others want us to? If I put a gun to your head and have the value and belief that you should die, is that acceptable to you? Are you a bigot for not allowing me to express my freedom of belief? Obviously, values are not equal. Some work and some don't. Or more specifically, some represent a closer approximation to reality and others do not. And the farther those values are from this natural order, the more destructive they often become, not just to the individual or group, but to all of us as a collective society. And there rests a distinct social imperative that is often ignored or feared. The taboo associated with challenging what others think uh, under the still convenient notion that all values are equal is simply not tenable. You are, in fact, partially responsible for the thoughts and values of others, and they are, in fact, responsible for yours. There is nowhere to hide from the collective consciousness and an underlying thesis of this presentation is that until a human society is able to find and share a basic, common, working, responsible, near empirical value set, we're basically doomed. My hope here, in turn, is to generate a personal and social ref reflection, if you will, with, with respect to what you believe and why, eventually to be framed within the social context I keep alluding to. It will be argued that the failure of emergent perception to be open and listen to the world we live in rather than impose upon it, you know, with these traditional assumptions we blindly hold as empirical, is the psychological root of the problems we see in the world today, environmental, social. It is a value system disorder that is continually created and reinforced by the social system we inhabit and share ideologically. And if uncorrected, it could lead to the collapse of human society as we know it today. A collapse, by the way, 
which, if you're paying attention, is accelerating right now across the world. Fueled again by a set of detrimental perspectives that go largely unrecognized, like cancer cells go unrecognized to an immune system. In 1884, a unique book was published called Flatland. And apart from some very clever social commentary, the work gave a perspective of what it would be like to live in a two-dimensional reality, as opposed to the three-dimensional one that we share. One could go left and right, forward and back, but there was no such thing as up and down. Perspective was hence restricted. And if something from the third dimension was to come and visit this two-dimensional reality, the perception of that object would be confined to the properties enabled by the two-dimensional view. So a three-dimensional object moving up and down through the two-dimensional plane would be perceived by the inhabitants as this mysterious mutating two-dimensional line. I would like to use this, this abstract notion as a very loose metaphor with respect to cultural perception. What if those in the two-dimensional flatland had actually always been in the three-dimensional space, but their frame of reference was so limited by the tools of measurement they had, their experience so consistent with the two-dimensional world, their associated values so ingrained and stubborn as generations passed that they were simply unable to reconcile its presence even though it was obviously there. They might have even established whole philosophies and institutions based on the appearance of their world, perhaps the Church of Squares, <laughs> or linear economics, or the party line of politics. But as time went on and their tools and education grew, the consequences of their perceptual folly started to manifest, and the beliefs and institutions they had created started to draw a confusion and disorder as a natural evolution. And they might have thought, how could the very fabric of our assumptions that we all share of this reality that seem correct and, and almost provable over long periods of time, how could they actually be wrong? Around 200 BC, a Greek mathematician named Aristosthenes estimated the circumference of the planet Earth, likely the first mathematically to solidify that it was truly round and not flat. A rather dramatic finding since, well, it certainly looks flat, doesn't it? In Psalm 93 of the Bible, it states that the world is firmly established, it cannot be moved. And in another passage, it states the sun rises and the sun sets and then hurries to rise again. Well, that would make sense too, wouldn't it? After all, when you look at the sky, it appears to be moving around us. In fact, we still use that premise of thought in our language. We still say up and down, well, it's really out and in. Uh, we even still say sunrise and sunset, interestingly enough. It wasn't until Galileo uh, really introduced our now obvious heliocentric universe, solar system, excuse me, and uh, it was confirmed, uh, obviously, amongst much traditional controversy, I might add. And since we're on the subject of the stars, to continue this type of example as I inch into value systems that perhaps might be shared in the common community, one of the most persistent pastimes of human indulgence since the beginning of recorded history, a practice that has generated a flourishing economic industry to this day, spreading across virtually all cultures, is the practice of astrology. In Western astrology, the signs of the zodiac, depending on their positions in certain time, at a certain time, are thought to have predictive power in some interpretive form, horoscopes, etc. In fact, astrology is so popular today across the world that you can't really read a newspaper without finding a column on it. I even tend myself to be asked what my sign is a few times a month when I engage different conferences. It's very, very common. But what, what, is, the basic, what is the basic perceptual source of this belief, especially in Western tradition? Well, it might as well be straight out of the book Flatland. First of all, the view of all constellations are seen as two-dimensional, yet the luminance of those celestial bodies that make up those forms are actually distributed across vast distances in three-dimensional space. Constellations as we know them simply do not exist outside of the prima facie pictures we see in the night sky. Second, stars are not fixed as we came to understand. They are born and they die like us. It is the illusion of permanence given our very, very short duration on this planet in regards to human evolution and cosmic time that we think these 2D pictures will be the same for eternity, holding hence empirical value. Third, to you know, reintegrate the 2D flaw, if you will, it's only a fixed perception from the planet Earth. 
if we were viewing these same stars from another side of the Milky Way galaxy from a different angle, they would not represent anything close to the forms we see from here. So despite the popular culture's interest, which is actually quite romantic, I have to admit, given the deep yearning to understand our place in relationship to the universe, relationship, by the way, which is the most common definition of spirituality, we are only left, however, to realize that in what I will call the expanded dimensional reality, debunking the limited dimensional perception, no different than the surface uh, thinking that the world was flat or the sun moved around the earth, you know, but yet most today won't argue those facts as adamantly as they will argue their belief in astrology. Another example of this limited dimensional perception comes from the cultural characteristics of the period of origin of certain ideas. Just as the constellations still today are recognized and named, recognized for their names after spoons and ox carts and scales and common animals, uh, as opposed to space shuttles and TVs and laptops and, and, and smartphones, the projections of thought of any point in time can only reflect the state of knowledge at that point in time. It's a dead giveaway. The traditional religious systems of belief, for example, contain the rhetoric not of an advanced technological society or a society of advancements in, say, civil rights or advanced medical treatments. No, it contains the period-based cultural values that occurred thousands of years in the past. Did God invent man or did man invent God? Do the depictions of monotheistic gods appear like us? Why do they? Why do they appear like us? Why do they have tempers like man? Why are they emotional and judgmental and volatile and retributive? Why is it that monotheism is common to des desolate desert cultures while polytheism is common to lush, diverse rainforest cultures? Is it random chance that nearly all the early gods of Greece and Egypt actually related to natural phenomenon? The sun, the moon, the stars, the ocean, water. It's almost as though the minds of those who created these stories and ideas were trying to figure out what the natural world was and what it was doing. And they could only impose their culturally specific ideas upon them as the organism of knowledge continued its evolution. Why are the gods in traditional African religions black and the gods of the West white? Why are the gods of patriarchal societies always male? And why is it that people born into cultures that support these beliefs tend to perpetuate them? How often do you hear of an Arab person born in a Muslim culture magically becoming Jewish as a child? I'm sorry to stand in what could be a controversial opposition to the beliefs of what are really billions of people that ascribe to, say, astrology or theistic religious belief. But when the perceptual context of origin of these belief systems are taken into account, we find a clear, limited dimensional perception, cloaked as relevant through traditional perpetuation, denying the emergent nature of our reality. And this leads me to the true focus of this talk, believe it or not, for the limited dimensional perception, and I apologize for the kind of annoying techno jargon, but it's the best I can come up with. This limited dimensional perception I speak of is not limited to these obvious examples. And the very fabric of modern society with respect to our economic, legal, and political system is no different. Not to mention the vast number of contemporary value distortions that continue to masquerade as viable, applicable, and hence normal. How many people here are Republicans? How many people here are Democrats? How many people are Republicans and don't want to say How many people here are independents? How many people here reject all political parties and find the political concept itself as outdated, unscientific, and detrimental to social progress? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's try another one. How many people here are capitalists? <laughs> How many people here are socialists? How many people here find such notions to be equally as outdated, arbitrary, and useless with respect to truly efficient economic management? Thank you. Just as people are born into a culture that supports traditional religious belief tend to conform their values 
and to perpetuate those values without critical thought, so do almost all of us when it comes to our modern social institutions, which we think are intellectually viable and separate from the religious dogma. Let's take, for example, government and politics. Politics in Greek means of, for, or relating to citizens. It's essentially a decision-making method of social operation. And while variance does exist, the most dominant form today is that some kind of representative government where the interests of the people are said to have some expression through the representation. In the United States, for example, we are said to have a constitutional republic. This is basically a form of representative democracy which must govern within the confines of existing constitutional law, which is a fairly rigid set of preconceived declarations that apply not only to the conduct of government, but also to the people. Why not pure democracy? Well, because pure democracy is 100 white men hanging one black man. The originators of this country had a decent intuition about the dangers of crowd mentality. In the words of Thomas Jefferson, a democracy is nothing more than mob rule where 51% of people may take away the rights of the other 49%. So democracy, for it to be applicable, is really contingent upon the masses being educated about their environment so their votes have quality. And since that's very, 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 very hard to qualify, a benchmark of rights Hence, the Constitution had to be created to enable some form of regulation. I hope that makes sense, because this, this train of thought is going to carry farther. It's a benchmark. The issue of a benchmark, if you will, as I like to present in this exercise, doesn't just occur with democracy. It's also applicable to the monetary system or the market system of monetary economics, to be specific. Today, we have what you call a free market. It has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? It seems to feed the same value association we have regarding democracy, you know, so-called freedom of choice. The free market means that through the movement of money, power and property can be bought and sold, the only limitation being the state of your wealth, hence your purchasing power, the actions of your competitors, and the laws, of course, created to maintain order within the system. And it's the law attribute that I find the most interesting. This is the benchmark, the legislation, or the regulatory game rules, if you will, because it's just a game. This benchmark regulation is inherent in both the free market and democracy, two ideas based, again, upon the broad romantic view of free choice. This, to me, is really interesting. For these benchmarks basically imply some type of third-party external empirical reality, don't they? an empirical reality that would, that would have to inherently be absent of some form of choice and freedom for them to exist as they do. Think about that for a moment. It's a contradiction, and this contradiction can be seen as an influence coming from, in my view, the new emergent understandings that arise to the evolution of knowledge. New experience-driven information trying to self-correct prior beliefs through trial and error, or through intuitive step-by-step -step adaptation. In other words, the very foundational premise of democracy in the free market as far as theory is intrinsically flawed, obviously. Something is missing, or many things are missing, because it can't work on its own. It requires influence of a third-party decision process. Democracy is contingent upon an informed public along with certain ever-present rights which are essentially there because it is assumed that the public doesn't know them, but they should. Likewise, the free market requires third-party rules to maintain order, rules which often, for example, demand certain environmental safeties, pollution protocols, uh, basic efficiency protocols. You know this. I mean, we all know that the system as it stands in the free market left to its own devices uh, would use up just about everything, as I will allude to here in a little while. The system can't stand on its own. It will self-destruct. Put another way, these rules are needed to protect the free market and democracy from itself. Otherwise, again, they will self-destruct. As an extended example, if it wasn't for the regulations existing against, say, corporate monopoly, 
the world would have been taken over by one corporation a long, long time ago. Despite the statistically void, utterly false notions perpetuated by economists that the more free the market, the more efficient, free market competition is one of the most hegemonic concepts ever invented. While mob rule democracy, again continuing our comparison, can generate mass irrationality with no basis in reality, if not properly collared through rights and education. Sorry to drill this in, but it's very important. By the way, I suggest a book called The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind. If you want to read about how crowd mentality can override independent thought in a very caustic way, it's well documented that people lose their objectivity and lose their sense of control when involved in mass appeal. And that isn't just, say, for a soccer riot. It happens through the media. It happens through many different forms. So then, what is this benchmark that we keep seeing? What, it, what is really being referenced in the broad view? Using the example of rights for democracy and regulation for the free market, what do those two issues really reach for? It reaches for the natural order, or more operationally, scientific causality. That is what is breaching through the concrete. The most dangerous value we can have floating around the culture today, and I hope everyone can really listen carefully to this, the most dangerous value we have floating around the culture today is the idea that any of us have freedom of choice or the right to our own opinion, especially when it comes to issues of human survival and sustainability. We cannot choose, we can only align if we wish to survive and prosper, period. There is simply no such thing as freedom when the benchmark of scientific causality is brought into the equation with respect to any action or goal. The only caveat is the emergent uncertainty of the evolution of knowledge, which again does require a threshold of flexibility. Why? Because again, we don't know everything. But we do seem to get closer and closer to more empirical understandings as time moves forward. Is there really any freedom to how we organize our economy on a finite planet if the goal is to create the most efficient, sustainable means of production, distribution, and regeneration? No, there isn't. Industry is a technical process, a calculation problem, where the variables of human needs, physical science, and earthly resources are brought into a single regulatory equation, if you will. The properties of our resources can be scientifically quantified now, strategically assessed as far as their purpose, strategically oriented as far as the design in the most logical manner, distributed through the exact same logic of pure efficiency. We have globalization on this planet. What the hell are we doing? We're taking stuff from all over the world, exploiting labor, moving it around, wasting tons of energy, when we could easily develop production methods in local communities where you save x-fold amount of energy, the distance between elements moving is, is x-fold less. Uh, it's insane. But yet, the system perpetuates that. But that's for a larger order subject that I don't have time to go into. We could strategically orient industry, and it's self-evident as we do based on the physics of our reality and where things are. We could enable an efficiency never known before. It becomes self-evident. And why would we possibly, with regard to sustainability, want to do anything less? As counterintuitive and culturally obtuse as it may seem, there is no freedom or opinion in our technical reality. There is only the most efficient way up until now, and the rest is simply inefficient. The definition of economy in Greek means management of a household. A reduction of waste and maximized efficiency is inherent in this premise. Is this the way our current free market system is operating? Well, let's take a step back again. What drives a global economy? Consumption, and the more the better. More consumption means more jobs, better GDP, and hence enabling more consumption through purchasing power that's enabled. Is that efficient? Shouldn't preservation and reducing waste be the basis of an economy on a finite planet by definition? How can an economy based on the need for constant growth and turnover, and even, even an economy based on constant need for em employment, be economizing anything at all. Then there's this thing called cost efficiency. 
Cost efficiency demands cutting expenses to remain competitive in the marketplace. Every single product created by any corporation today, without exception, is immediately inferior by design for the market requirement to cut creation costs in favor of lowering the output purchasing price to maintain a competitive edge automatically reduces the quality of any given item by default. It is impossible to create the strategically best, long-lasting anything in our society, and this translates into outrageous amounts of wasted resources. Likewise, the same mechanism is also reinforcing environmental disregard, depletion, and pollution. I mean, there's everyone's trying to save money. Why are they, you think they're going to really care about the environment? The logic is against it. We see this constant in the world today among many, many other issues I could list. In fact, if you take a moment to really step back and think about this, not only is this inefficiency a characteristic of the market model, it's actually the fundamental driver. Having clean, say, unpolluted water in your home might seem like a nice thing and gesture, but the fact that money is not being exchanged for that is anathema to the economic sustainability that we've come to understand. So more pollution means more profit. More disease means more jobs. Ad infinitum. In fact, I would go so far to say, as pointed out here, that sustainability, efficiency, and preservation empirically are the enemies of our economic system. And that's, unfortunately, the firm reality. Those out there who talk about a green economy or the like, as though there's such a thing that could possibly exist in this system, posing solutions within this structural order, such as renewable energies, energy credits, carbon footprint stuff or the like, they are not understanding what's actually at work here. You cannot have a true green or even close to whatever you would consider a sustainable economy in the market model of economics. It is technically impossible. The system would fail if we ever wanted to operate on a truly technical, sustainable level, for the system is in fact fueled by the exact opposite set of mechanics. I would even go so far to challenge for those out there that um, basically at this stage are not in favor of the complete abolition of the market economy as the solution to the destruction of our environment, not to mention the collapse of the social order itself we are seeing, while working to replace this system with a truly technical approach for resource management, proper scientific allocation, seeking the highest level of efficiency possible at every turn in production and distribution for maximum sustainability, which is a technical distinction, including proper allocation of labor and everything else, really just engaging in patchwork. It's not going to do anything in the long run. And we're wasting time because time is literally running out. This again, coming back to my premise, is the result of our limited dimensional perception. We have based our economy on outdated notions of human behavior and convoluted notions of supposed freedom and ignored the true technical reality, true environmental reality that actually supports and sustains our lives and creates good public health. This realization that our true economic benchmark is science, and hence the self-evident calculation requirement needed to streamline our efficiency inherently voids the entire basis, again, of free market economics itself. I can't reiterate that enough. For it simply makes zero technical sense scientifically and is, in fact, provably now working against our survival and accelerating. Coming back to politics, let's take a quantum leap outside of our traditional assumptions for a moment. What does the political institution and hence government really do? Why do we even have it? They work to compensate for the inefficiency of the economy. That's it. That's the only reason they're there. When people are not getting their needs met, they often resort to so-called crime. So government invents laws to silence those victims of the economic efficiency. Likewise, if we need resources being held in another sovereign nation, aka region of the planet, and we are not economically getting along with them, we engage in war to steal those resources, not to mention protect ourselves from others who might want to steal ours. There is no war in history 
that has not been based upon resource acquisition or protection. Likewise, the world's divided into gangs. You ever notice that? We still have these things called countries. We still assume a socially Darwin Darwinistic pretense with the very existence of these nation states, not to mention the divisive patriotic value distortions that are born out of it. Here, once again, we have the limited dimensional perspective clashing with an emergent multidimensional reality. Are countries relevant in technical terms? How could we possibly define them outside of our opinions? A, all humans share the same basic needs. And B, the resources that we all need have no idea what a country is. And they are dispersed everywhere on this planet in one single unified <coughs> ecosystem. If there's anything positive that came out of the U.S. and Russian Cold War that almost triggered, triggered complete nuclear disaster decades ago, it was the realization that radiation fallout in nuclear winter never heard of countries, flags, or sovereignty. Just as the pollution from the Japanese power plants that melted down a while back, it didn't need passports to cross over to other countries' atmospheres. I hope my point is clear. The fact is, there is only and can only be one global economy. And hence, there is only one and can only be one global society for our economic premise is what defines us. And that's what our survival is. The socioeconomic system of our time is as archaic, dogmatically religious, and pseudoscientific as any dogmatic religious belief. They are completely decoupled from the benchmark of our scientific emergent reality, which is being denied held in place by traditional, non-emergent institutions, which, mark my words, will be what destroys life on this planet as we know it, if the multidimensional reality that is springing up is not realized and brought to the surface quickly. The central problem we face is that the economic system is actually still systematically reinforcing itself, continuing to hold this paradigm in place by the ongoing values and actions of the masses who do not see the true source of the problem because they're trapped inside of it. And they are accelerating its effects. For example, if anyone out there frames their sense of leadership or success based on money or acclaim, you have a rude awakening coming to you. In fact, I, could, I couldn't help but notice reading the pamphlet of all the well-meaning presentations in this event. And they seem to frame things in a very similar way as far as the way they, they orient themselves in this system. And I don't blame them and don't put them down, but I hope I hope this definition can eventually change. What is true success? Is success how well you manage your company, sell a book, gain a profit, or anything that engages the current socioeconomic paradigm? If you agree with what I have just described with respect to the economic system, those focusing on short-term material success might very well be assisting in their own long-term failure and demise, for they are only perpetuating a detrimental social system in the end that, as I said before, will get the best of all of us if it isn't stopped. Shouldn't true success be your ability to adapt to the emergence of new information? Improving your relationship with the natural order benchmark that we've spoken of? Is there really anything else that can possibly define success in the broadest possible terms? Proper alignment with whatever reality happens to be advancing itself and you being with it? Do our this relationships and marriages and banks, bank accounts and even our children, our status, our acclaim, really mean anything when it's stepped back to the larger order of what it means to relate to the world that you live in? There's a common term we frequently hear these days, corruption. It seems to be all over the news and you can't possibly escape it. How would you define corruption broadly? I would define it as the initiation or support of deprivation, exploitation, and or abuse, either social or environmental. If this definition is accepted, then it is logically correct to say that all acts of commerce are inherently corrupt. If you define corruption as deprivation, exploitation, or abuse, every time you mark up a value on a good you sell or cut corners to save money, you are engaging in deprivation, exploitation, and abuse by its systemic causal effect and intrinsic rationale. 
That is the behavior our social system requires to continue. And that distortion is currently masked as normality. In conclusion, and as a final rogue example of this limited dimensional perspective, meeting an emergent multi-dimensional reality that is forcing its hand, there is no you and there is no me. We live in a world which assumes division. Why? Because that is what we perceive with our five senses, limited sense organs. But molecular study has proven the opposite. It doesn't see it that way. There is a perpetual ebb and flow and exchange of molecular, molecular data constantly happening with you, within you and outside of you, interweaving with your environment at all times and many levels. Concurrently, our life support is explicitly symbiotic as well. We need resources to live, and hence the connection to our evolutionarily adapted habitat that basically created us over generational time. There's, no, there's absolutely no disconnect. In the words of uh, Jock Fresco, you don't see the plug up our ass, but it happens to be there. And then we have, then we have the knowledge level as well, as I alluded to before. We exist in a group mind. Newton did not invent gravity, just as Einstein did not invent relativity. For him to do so, he would have had to invent the whole of mathematical development since the beginning of time, along with all the tools and supporting provisions and everything else that comprised his state of knowledge naturally at that point in history. Every word coming out of, out of my mouth has been learned. We only have the illusion of novelty because each of us appear to originate in seemingly separate pockets of experience in this connected unison that we share. And hence, our supposed creations seem unique and original and novel, but they're only extensions. As stated at the beginning, there's nowhere to hide from the collective consciousness, and we are all responsible for each other. The underlying meaning of this presentation, if you will, is that until human society, again, is able to find a basic, common, working, responsible value set which we can basically agree upon, which is consistently pinged against the emerging benchmark of our scientific reality, we have a very, very difficult road ahead. Within this context, as we listen to the world around us, I consider the most active value orientation we can have, which almost guarantees an empathetic reaction which hopefully can maintain this social diligence that's required. I consider the acceptance of our intrinsic unification to be the most powerful form of expression of these ideas, an acknowledgment of the oneness as it is poetically termed. This oneness over division value seems to be the ultimate example, at least this point in time, of our limited dimensional perception being overcome by the multidimensional reality and if properly understood, there could be no basis for war. There could be no logic for greed. There could be no such thing as inefficiency and waste. No basis for poverty. There can't possibly be class. And in fact, as abstract and misunderstood as it might sound, there can be no basis to define you, and there can be no basis to define me. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.